to a world in chaos, facing destruction and unrest. We come with a message of peace, the peace that comes from the truth. We need your help to go forward on this mission. Support Shalom World. Shalomworld.org slash donate. sessions and through the day. Thank you, uh, Nathan, for your work in that last session. I thought um, it was just a wonderful um, presentation of the theme. Um, wonderful presentation from Mark and, and Trish for uh, hearing the stories in, in, in people's lives um, and how the action of the spirit is working. It's, uh, it's fantastic. So, that's the work of the Spirit. The Spirit's always wanting to call us on to move us uh, forward. And I'm going to now invite uh, Shane Bennett. He's got a hard act to follow in that last session, Shane. But let's put our hands together to welcome Shane to share with us. Thank you for the one supporter over in the <laughs> Into the microphone. The problem is I speak kangaroo. <laughs> First of all, let me say what a privilege it is to be here and uh, a great joy to share this important time with you all. 
In a particular way, I'd like to address my brothers and sisters around the Pacific and those of the Pacific who are here with us personally. Because I think we owe a great debt of thanks to especially the peoples of the Pacific, but also I would add the peoples of Southeast Asia and India who have contributed so much to the local churches in Australia. Uh, I have two parishes close to me that are vibrant parishes only, only because of the presence of people from the Pacific Islands, from Southeast Asia and from India who have contributed so much to the life of those parishes and as I travel to different parts of Australia, even in the more remote areas, I see these same faces again and again nourishing, bringing faith where the faith of Australians has diminished, we are enriched by the faith of others coming from outside. So can I just honour you and say thank you uh, for all that you have contributed. Now when I began, I heard of, <laughs> when Peter invited me to speak here, um, I started praying for some leading from the Lord. And you know what I got? The scripture I got was about Paul, St. Paul, calling on the churches to take up a collection. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> For the moment, we are not taking up a collection. I don't know what Peter's doing later. <laughs> And as I read these scriptures, and particularly in um, Corinthians 1 and 2, we see Paul writing to various churches and inviting them to contribute to the church in Jerusalem because of the great famine that they've been through and the poverty that they're experiencing. Now, these churches weren't always united. You know, you would have some Jewish some more Gentile-focused churches. And there was a certain disunity there. But Paul didn't hesitate to call them together for this particular purpose. And when he described the collection, he used these words. First of all, he said it was a fellowship to show unity between Jew and Gentile believers. It was a service ministry to the saints, a way of serving those in need. But his most frequent description was that it was an act of grace, often translated a generous undertaking. It was also described as a blessing, a divine service. He also uses a, a series of extravagant descriptions uh, such as the utmost eagerness or describing the gift as being both bountiful and voluntary. And so what's the connection here? For me, the connection is quite clear because at the heart of this collection was an opportunity for each of the churches, whether Jewish or Gentile in their, their background, to express unity and to act together for the common good. Now, brothers and sisters, it seems to me, as it has seemed to others, that this Oceania evangelization program is an opportunity given to us by the Holy Spirit, who calls us into a united vision for the evangelization of the churches in Oceania. Father Victor described this morning that this is a, a kairos moment. And Trish said something very similar. She said this was a, a, a special moment. And I believe that's true. It's an opportunity for us, but an opportunity which needs to be responded to. Just because God gives us an opportunity, as, as Bree so eloquently described, it doesn't mean we follow it. In fact, there are many reasons that we can go off track. And 
you know, as we look at this, this question of a program for evangelization of the churches in Oceania, that is huge. It's huge. Where, where do we begin? How can we begin? How, how do we ever take on such a project? Well, first of all, let me say we have already begun. We have already begun. This is not step one. <laughs> you know, the evangelization of the churches in Oceania began a long time ago. Began a long time ago when men and women gave their lives for the establishment of the church in this part of the world. But in this specific program, how long has it been going, Pete? Okay. Okay. Ten months. Sounds like we're, we're due for a delivery. <laughs> Call the doctor. <laughs> It's very young, but we have already begun. And this gathering here and the gathering of the brothers and sisters in all the hubs, you have begun. You have begun a work of responding to the Holy Spirit. Now, in November 2001, one of our modern saints, Pope John Paul II, wrote a letter of encouragement to the Church of Oceania. And he identified both the challenge before us and a pathway forward. And when I went back and read this letter of encouragement, I knew that it was a word for us. And I want to let the words of Pope John Paul II lead us on a bit of a journey this afternoon and help us to make a response in the Holy Spirit. And he says this, the Lord has called the church in Oceania to himself. As always, the call involves ascending forth on mission. The purpose of being with Jesus is to go forth from Jesus. In his, in his power, and in his grace. Christ is now calling the church to share in his mission with new energy and creativity. Now, he goes on to say, how can the church be an effective instrument of Jesus Christ who now wants to meet the peoples of Oceania in new ways? And I'd like to outline just a, a few fundamental points that he sees as necessary for this great vision to unfold. And the first is for us to rediscover or hear again the call of Jesus who says, come follow me. Now this is not a time to hold back, whether it's through fear or shame or feeling unworthy. These are all instruments of the evil one who want to tie our hands and our feet and our tongues. Jesus is the one who came for those who are sinners. The self-righteous have no need of Jesus. Only the sinners. And if you feel like you're a sinner, Jesus is the person for you. He is the one who will save you. He is the one who transforms shame into a testimony of life. Jesus does not allow shame, guilt, unworthiness to hold us back. He promises to deal with those things, to enable us to move past them, to experience the forgiveness that we heard about. To overcome the shame and to tell us we are worthy 
because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. We need to be still long enough to hear the voice of Jesus cry out in our own hearts, come and follow me. Not just once, but each day. And for us, the challenge, as as Mark has shared, is to keep saying yes. I was listening to the testimony of a, a young man who said, you know, I don't have a lot to say, but the conviction I have in, in, in God is to turn up and say yes. And I thought, what a great summary. To be available and to say yes to whatever God asks of us. Now, that's sec- the second point is intimately linked to the first. We are called to make an active response to our baptism. Our baptism calls us into mission, each and every one of us. We are called to actively and intentionally respond to the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out upon us in baptism and further strengthened in confirmation. Do we actually believe in this? You know, is this all stuff in our heads? Oh, yeah, here's the seven gifts of the Spirit and here's the fruit of the Spirit and here's the charisms. And What's all that mean if it doesn't get manifest in reality? We can say the Holy Spirit is powerless. We can say God is powerless. Does my life say that God has power? Does my life say that the Holy Spirit is active and transforming my life? St. John of the Cross said, <laughs> if, you, if you haven't, if you are asking yourself the question of, have I experienced the Holy Spirit, you clearly haven't. Because the Holy Spirit is manifest in our lives, not as a secret, as a secret to ourselves, but the Holy Spirit is manifest in our lives in a way that changes us. Yes, and sometimes we don't see it clearly. But as we respond day by day, of course we can give witness to the action of the Holy Spirit and that is more visible looking back than looking in the present. We see the work of the Holy Spirit as we look back over our lives as was shared earlier this morning. How do we think we're going to find new and creative pathways forward? Pope John Paul reminds us, the first Christians were stirred by the Holy Spirit to believe in Christ and to proclaim as the world's only Saviour sent by the Father. In every age, every age, the agent of renewal and evangelization is the Holy Spirit who surely will not fail to help the church now to find the evangelizing energies and methods that are needed. You know, Pope Paul VI would tell us, we can't have a transformed world without transformed people. The starting place is always within. We can have the biggest vision in the world, but if that vision doesn't become manifest in my own life, how am I going to share it with the whole world? We need to discover or rediscover, as was said earlier, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because it's the Holy Spirit who leads us into a deeper encounter with Jesus Christ. The Catechism tells us that without an encounter with the Holy Spirit, we cannot know Jesus. We 
cannot know Jesus. You know, Pope Paul VI, when he gave his catechesis on the Holy Spirit in, in his great missionary document, uh, Evangelization in the Modern World, he talked about us being possessed by the Holy Spirit. Well, Hollywood has a go at talking about possession by the devil and so forth. But we are the manifestation of being possessed by the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit being alive and active and leading us in our day-to-day -day lives. Bringing to life the truth of the gospel. You know, we, we have to remember that the good news is good news not for the religious department of our lives, but for the whole of life. You know, the gospel makes the whole of life better. Our relationships with one another, our service of others, the way that we go about our work. And it was lovely to hear the testimony this morning uh, um, about you d discovering, discovering in your medical field the action of the Holy Spirit. What's your name again? I'm sorry. Louisa. Dr. Louisa, giving testimony about how God is active, how the missionary dimension of her life is active at each moment of the day. It's not confined to Sunday or when she goes out on mission. Mission is alive and well in her day-to-day -day encounters as it is for each one of us. Relationship with Jesus empowers us and as a result has the capacity to transform culture, to make a real difference to the lives of the people of Oceania. Now, in recent times we've heard many things uh, spoken about as needs of... Um, the whole environmental need of the peoples of Oceania. But you know, that, that can easily remain something really remote. It's when Jesus convicts our heart of the love of people, he actually causes us to do something about it. You know, some years ago I was working in Uganda and when we were giving, giving conferences and things, we were, the people would gather under sheets of plastic. And in the, the really very hot days, it was very hot under that plastic and then the intense rains would come and the big dips in the plastic and the people would be sleeping under here. And I thought, we have to do something better for these people. Now... The bishop had invited me to do something with evangelization and with, with young adults. But the thing that, that Jesus does is, we may begin there, but we, it doesn't end there. Evangelization involves us in the lives of people. And so, I felt we have to do something to respond to the dignity of these people and to care for them. And so, through the grace of God, we were able to build a, a center there, which was the fulfillment of, a, of their own hopes and desires. And in, in one sense, that sounds like it's going, um, it's one directional, but it certainly wasn't. They, they thanked me later for begging for them. I'd never thought of myself as begging but I went begging all over the world <laughs> to try and build this centre and amazingly it was a, a young man in the United States who was going into a religious order who'd received an inheritance that he didn't want or need and he said, I'll give you uh, X amount of dollars which was the amount that basically covered the construction of the building. But I have to say, in my work and uh, with the people in Uganda, I have found myself in projects 
with chickens, pigs, goats, pineapples. <laughs> but more than that, I've found myself in a relationship of love with those people because um, they have loved me freely, abundantly, and in taking groups of people to Uganda, you know, peop I guess Australians are generous and it comes out of a spirit of generosity. They say, what can we do? How can we contribute? And we say to them, let the people love you. Open yourself to that love. If there are needs, they, you will find them. But our greatest need is to discover one another in love. To allow the love of Jesus to unite us. You know, we can have, it's, it's not difficult to have lofty ideas about great projects. There's been many of them. But fundamentally, we need our hearts converted. And I have to say this very honestly, it's not easy, it's not difficult to be derailed in great projects. That the cockatoos that we heard about this morning scream very loudly. The cockatoos which say you need to look after yourself. You haven't got time for these projects. You need to get on with your studies. You don't even know these people. Perhaps there's been some great football rivalry. I travelled one, <laughs> one day with the Tongan uh, rugby, National Rugby Union team, flying from New Zealand where they'd just been beaten terribly. <laughs> but they were the happiest people I think I've ever met. <laughs> there was no sadness on that flight. Perhaps there's a tendency to, for competition or resentment of one nation to another for various reasons. Sometimes that's historical. Who knows? The thing is, no matter where we live, no matter who we are, we can become distracted from this great vision of the evangelization of the peoples of Oceania and what we need to hold us to the target is a conversion of heart, is a conversion of heart that we might take on the heart of Jesus. That we would love the peoples of Oceania and when we love one another we are more ready to be concerned about the circumstances and the life conditions of others. And we will work together to find ways of responding to them. Pope John Paul had a special concern. And one of those special concerns was young people. I would like the young people in this room to please stand up, or those who identify as young people. <laughs> and I trust those people around in the hubs are standing up as well. I have some special words for you from Pope John Paul II. And he says, do not be afraid to commit yourselves to the task of making Christ known and loved, especially among the many people of your own age who make up the largest part of the population. Now, some of you are a little reluctant to stand. <laughs> I know how you feel, brother. <laughs> 
But Jesus himself, and in words echoed by Pope John Paul II, calls you into this great mission. Everybody has a part. And sometimes younger people feel like my part is to be played somewhat later in life. But what I say to you is your part is to be played now. And, you know, Pope Francis has picked up on this, as has a number of others who once the church would say, you are the church of the future. No, you're the church of the present. We need your voice, we need your energy, we need your courage, we need your creativity, we need your capacity to change, to respond, to do new things. And I pray that us older people will not get in the way of that. Because while each of us are called to take up this vision of evangelization, that people my age or those around within the 20 years I've side <laughs> are called to stand with you, around you and beside you, to uphold you, to make your unique contribution to the church of this time. And certainly in countries like Australia and, and New Zealand, we need this commitment of yours. I was talking to the late uh, the Bishop of Tonga, Bishop Sione Foliaki, and he had words of wisdom for the Pacific. And he said, Shane, today we see young people in the churches of the Pacific, but I see a day coming when the secular influence will become so strong that it, it will erode the faith of young people in the Pacific Islands. And when that day comes, if we have not called young people to a personal commitment to Christ, they will not stand, but will be carried by the secular tide. This is what we see in Australia and New Zealand already, and its influence is beginning to pervade the Pacific as well. Please sit down. We need your commitment. The bishops of Oceania joined their voices to the fathers of the Second Vatican Council in calling for the need for youth to youth ministry. Brothers and sisters, the, the challenge is huge. Let's not kid ourselves. It's a huge challenge, but one which can be responded to. The work of evangelization can only be achieved by us working together in communion. Not just one group or another group, but us working together in communion with one another and with the Holy Spirit to guide us. Let's continue the journey. Let's ask the Lord to convert our hearts that we may have a love for one another, that we may take up the mission of Jesus and be faithful to it. Amen? Amen. Thank you, uh, Shane, for just a wonderful um, presentation and uh, a really rich uh, presentation. Um, might just uh, have a chat to the person next to you. What speaks to you um, in Shane's uh, uh, presentation to us?
Just going to invite uh, Father Chris um, to come forward um, and share with us. Now, lead us into this uh, um, adoration and, and reconciliation. Uh, so we've been uh, hearing about uh, how we uh, make Jesus more the Lord of our life, and uh, this is a beautiful moment that we have of reconciliation uh, and also adoration to be in the presence of the Lord. Uh, that uh, we know that the Lord, He comes to be with us where we're at, uh, that He's not just the Lord of all the good things, uh, but that He comes into the mess of our lives as well. And we want to be able to bring those things to Him, uh, just openly uh, and vulnerably to, to a God who really meets us in that vulnerability. That's really what the cross is all about, that God comes to us and uh, He just opens His arms and uh, comes in this, in this form of real weakness so that we can come to Him, that we can approach Him, uh, so firstly, we'll, uh, through adoration, that uh, uh, Jesus is coming to us in such a humble way uh, that we can just come and be ourselves in his presence. And then in a really personal way as well, in, in reconciliation, uh, that it's a great privilege uh, for us as priests uh, to really to minister the love of God, the mercy of God, uh, that God come to us. Uh, and then it can be a really, a really vulnerable thing to come to reconciliation. I find that myself, uh, that when I go... Uh, that, you know, like there's a, a kind of a struggle that you, uh, you sort of have to, you know, put yourself out there and speak uh, of the things that uh, you're ashamed of and things that you uh, want to kind of push away. Uh, but I've found as I've just brought those into the light, it just brings so much peace uh, that uh, those, uh, those struggles and those burdens, uh, just, they just washed away. And so we want to really encourage you today uh, to, to go to reconciliation. Uh, there'll be five priests uh, and, and even if you want to just duck away now and get in there quick, um, so there'll be Father Ken uh, in, just in the room there, and then Father David, uh, and then also Father Victor's going to be in the confessional, and we'll have, because we haven't got much space, so we'll have a couple of priests up the front, okay? So, uh, so just wanting to encourage you to, to really use that, that sacrament, uh, that it's, it's God's love, God's mercy coming to you in the midst of, of your mess, uh, where you kind of feel uh, ashamed, uh, that, that it's just such an awesome opportunity to, to take uh, today. Also, I just wanted to just uh, give us a bit of a, a plan for the rest of the day that we're moving into this time of reconciliation and then we'll have, uh, we'll have dinner. And then after dinner, we'll have uh, mass together. And so we're inviting you uh, to be part of our uh, charismatic mass here at St. Benedict's. So it might be a little bit different uh, for, a, for a number of you. Uh, and so just to give you a bit of a heads up, uh, some of those things, and feel free to ask us over dinner, <laughs> like, what's, what are you talking about? Uh, and so the charismatic mass is really, like, it's really at the heart of what we're talking about, that, that as uh, Shane was saying, that it's not just words, you know, the, the Holy Spirit sort of, uh, some words that we talk about in a catechism class, but the Holy Spirit is alive and active in us, that we've been, we've given the gift of the Holy Spirit at our baptism, and it's really about allowing the Holy Spirit to be stirred up inside of us. Uh, we talk about the Holy Spirit as a dove, but he's also known as a wild goose uh, that kind of stirs things up and, and does something new, not what we're expecting. And so we have to trust him uh, and to open ourselves to him. And, and I had a simple experience of what we're going to be having tonight where we'll have mass together and there'll be a time of praise. And, and during the praise times, there might be some funny noises coming out of some of the people's mouths. And that's uh, called praying in tongues. And that's really like God giving us a gift to be able to pray from our heart because we think a lot and we think we've got to try and articulate these nice prayers to God. And sometimes we don't know what to say, uh, whereas the Holy Spirit just gives us a prayer from the heart. And so really that's what that's about. Um, and so don't be too freaked out by that, um, that it's very much in our Catholic faith. And then the other part as well is um, prophecy, where it's, we, we believe that God is alive. You know, we've been talking about God, He's the Lord. He's alive and he does speak to us, uh, that he is the good shepherd and he speaks to our hearts. And so to be open, when we, when we hear God speaking to us for ourselves, we, we call that prayer. And when we hear God speaking to us for others, uh, we call that prophecy. And so it's really just asking God to, to speak a word uh, for us as a group, to be open to that. And there'll be some people that will help you to discern that. And so when you hear that, don't be, you know, don't, it's maybe a bit different for what you're used to experiencing at Mass, uh, but it's very much Catholic. Um, the church began at Pentecost. Okay, so 
Uh, and then after Mass, there'll be an opportunity to receive prayer as well. Um, so to pray and to have some people that are just praying for you uh, to receive the, the gift of the Holy Spirit in a new way, to allow the Holy Spirit to, to be really active in your life. And I experienced that when I was a uh, young person, when I was uh, 18 and went along to retreat. And I went to prayer and didn't know what it was all about, but it just changed my life. Um, it was a very simple prayer, uh, but I saw the fruits of that prayer just very, you know, almost straight away. And so, uh, and Father Ken will kind of unpack that a bit in the Mass today. So, just so that you, you kind of know where we're going. Uh, and so during this time now, as we uh, prepare our hearts, uh, there will be um, some, uh, what do you call them there, examination of conscience, uh, just to help you, uh, as you, if you're just needing a bit of a help in that. Uh, and we'll have uh, Jesus with us in the Blessed Sacrament. So just to make this time a time of prayer, uh, that we've had a lot of talking today, a lot of input. So this is really a time to, to be with the Lord. Uh, and uh, to just to spend that time with Him. And so those that are watching online, that they would also uh, have this time to be with the Lord and to have this time of prayer uh, and to prepare our hearts for the coming of the Holy Spirit in a new way in our lives. And so that's really what I wanted to say just for this time now. So we're going to just to kneel uh, and as we expose the Blessed Sacrament and open ourselves to uh, the presence of God uh, who comes to us in great weakness and vulnerability.
I was 27 teaching English.